So we're just going to take a minute. Um, and I'd like to say a quick prayer, but then uh, we'll just give us a minute to kind of set, set up the room a little bit. Lord, um, these are the times. You know, the, the name of that song really resonates with us. As these are uncharted waters, right? These are times that we haven't been in before. Um, so we ask for your mercy. We ask for your grace and for you to lead us and to lead us with wisdom and help us to, to really um, learn how to love more deeply, to really uh, go beyond fear and really look at to our fellow neighbors, both locally and globally, and figure out ways that we can meet needs and, and add support and, and be in prayer for. Um, so Lord, we look forward to everything that you have in store for us this day, and we love you and we praise you. And it, it, it can be difficult. We don't understand uh, the why a lot of times. So there's this idea of trusting in you, and, and that can often be difficult and uh, takes a wrestling with. Lord, we, we look forward to your presence. We look forward to your spirit leading us. And um, may your will be done, and may your kingdom come, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's just take a minute, and we're going to get a couple of things set up, and then we'll continue on. All right. So yeah, thank you. This is uh, this is really neat. I love that uh, we're able to to do this. You know, where um, we can't meet in in person, which I I miss, and um, that's a uh, it's always a, a great thing to be able to get together and be with one another. But you know, with these times that we just talked about, we're not able to do that, and we're gonna come around that. And I've been praying that this would just be a real powerful experience for all of us, you know, and I'm grateful we have a team here um, that put this all together, so I'm grateful for them, and uh, just be with us if we have different technical things, like I'm going to ask you to get that um, out of my view, so can you move that, drag it off to the right and don't fall down, <laughs> there you go, perfect, that helps, all right, and so we are in um, a series called Crap Happens, and we started this series before, um, you know, the coronavirus had been considered a pandemic. And so it, it, it's like as we've gone through this series, though, it's become very, very relevant um, to the, the suffering because the underlying theme of this series is this idea of suffering and that there's evil in the world. And, and how do we uh, wrestle with that? And, and what's our role in that? And how do we navigate pain and suffering? And in view of uh, if you have a Christian worldview where you believe that God is all-powerful and all-loving, you know, it's very difficult to, to sometimes reconcile the two. And so I really want you to, as we frame this talk, that you, you hold on to a couple of uh, real-life situations that you've been through where you've been in that dark place and you've had the long nights and you've wrestled with God or you've asked the questions or it pushed you away from God. You know, like I hope that we have... An, an audience where we have people from all walks of life, all different places on the faith journey. Um, because to me, this is a conversation. This is, uh, this is a, a very, very real and serious conversation and not to be taken lightly. Um, you know, just as a couple of things here. So doing it differently, I encourage you to interact. Kara is going to be on a laptop here and fielding any questions that you have, and then she'll, you know, give me different thoughts and questions, um, and we'll just kind of, we do this at church anyway, so I love that we can just kind of um, go with the flow of that, and so if you have questions during this time, please interact, and Carol will be throwing out different thoughts as well for you, and um, so in this series, I, I think that we, we talked about, we've had some discussion groups that formed. I really want you to be uh, contemplative and to be in discussion with uh, other people because I think that we learn best in groups. We learn best by uh, asking questions of one another and asking, what do you think about these things? And they're, they're difficult topics. Uh, this series is based off of um, a series called Crap Happens from a, a church in, in Minnesota, a pastor named Greg Boyd. And uh, so a lot of these thoughts are framed by him. And I think that... Um, you know, I've kind of just kind of massaged it a little bit, added some of my own thoughts to it, but I think it's it's something that um, we we want to dig a little deeper into these issues. And so, if you can be very authentic and real with your questions, you're not going to offend us. 
Um, I don't pretend to have all the answers either. This is, um, this is something for all of us to lean into. So maybe a quick little review is in week one, we talked about suffering happens and we talked about that, um, you know, God is all powerful, he's all good, and, and yet all this stuff happens and, and how do we come around that? And we talked about like where you get your view of God really matters. And we talked about like the, the scriptures really point us to, to Jesus Christ, like to study uh, his life and study his example because it talks about he is the word of God. He's the image of God. Uh, so, so what we see in Jesus is actually our picture of God and, and that should frame uh, how we do that. We talked about the different views of power. You know, if God is all powerful, it's important that we define what power is um, and that we didn't think that was a, um, what, what's the word, the, the Neanderthal power, but more wisdom and, and agape power. And so that's something to wrestle with. What does that mean? The idea that God uh, is all controlling, right? Do you believe that, that he controls everything? And if you, if you believe that, then you have to believe that he controls the good and the bad. So that's a, something to really wrestle with. And then secondly, we talked about in week two that feeling insignificant happens. And this is, in, you know, in a nutshell, just the idea that where does our value come from as human beings? And a lot of us, um, we, we've, we've talked about th this lie that um, it's about acquiring significance from the outside. So it's extrinsic value that we gain versus intrinsic value just because we were made in God's image um, and we're created for his purposes, you know. And so in that, we should have this sense of security in our identity in Christ. And again, there's tons of different thoughts we can go on in that. Um, and this morning, we're going to be talking about a very real topic of unanswered prayer happens. And before I go into that, I feel like this is a, a really good time to be talking about the coronavirus. And because I'm sure that, you know, for all of us, it's such it's so big and that like sometimes we feel like our prayers are just like a little drop in a big ocean. And, and what good are they and what good can come of that? Um, and it can kind of send us into a spiral if we're not if we're not mindful. Uh, so I, I want us to be able to hold a, a, its attention to manage the way that I look at it, where it's like we have to recognize the magnitude of the situation, right? Um, it's been considered a pandemic. And so I think that it's very important that we uh, align our actions with the, the severity of the situation. Now, in doing that, like I'm a person who, who, temp, who, who tends to like on, on the, uh, the safety issue, like I tend to not care about safety a whole lot in my own personal life. And, and uh, so I lean on that side. I have other people in my life that are very, very safety conscious. And so, um, you know, for me personally, it's like, you know, I'm taking it very seriously. I know it's very simple, but this idea of just washing my hands, you know, um, it's something that I would normally, ah, it's not a big deal, you know, but when, when something rises to the level of a pandemic and you look at yourself as, uh, again, I didn't cha challenge to look at ourselves as global citizens, that, that we want to do what we can do um, very practically and listening to the, the civic authorities that are putting things out there for us to really rather rally together. And from a scriptural perspective, we're called to love our neighbors. And so there's some real simple ways to do that. Um, and we put things on our, on our website and on Facebook to, to help you to just learn the different things that we can do. Um, just be wise, you know, and uh, the idea of social distancing and, and just being responsible citizens, really. But that's, that's on one hand, right? That's looking at the magnitude of the problem. But at the same time, that can become overwhelming and we can have a spirit of fear. And, and the Bible really cautions us to that. It says that we, don't, you know, we haven't been given a spirit of timidity or fear, but we've been given a spirit of power and love and of a sound mind. And so these are things that um, we want to be able to hold both of these things simultaneously. And I think oftentimes it's hard to do as human beings. And that's why we need a dependency on God and to trust him in this. Um, and so if you find yourself in that place where you're overwhelmed with worry and concern, I encourage you to, to surround yourself with, with other people that can help you to, to really come around this in a healthy way. Um, and then for me personally, as a, as a church leader, I, I feel like leadership is very, um, you know, something that we need in this moment across the board. But from a church leadership perspective, it's, it's really looking at what God has called us to be the church. And, uh, and, 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 you know, church history, when things like a plague have happened and, and things of that nature, it's like the church was known for running to, not running away from. And, and that running to is, is one, and it's not being like, uh, 
like this idea of like taking these, these awful risks. It's like, no, it's really understanding that we're called to love our neighbor. And, and that runs very deeply within us. Now we have to do that with wisdom, but there's going to be many opportunities here as a church, as churches around the world for us to really come around people that are, are fearful and, um, or also, you know, obviously experiencing um, the losses like Mark had, had talked about earlier. So how can we support one another? And I would encourage you like to even right now, like uh, type in different suggestions that you have. Like what are the needs that you're seeing um, or that you're experiencing, you know, um, or that you're hearing about? Like if you type those in, Carol will take some of those notes down and, and as a leadership team, we'll be considering what are some of the things that we can do to, to come around this in, in, a, in a very serious way. Um, and then obviously with the, the title of today's message, this idea of unanswered prayer happens, the value of prayer, even though you'll see in this, in this teaching that um, it, it's somewhat of an anomaly in some ways, it's actually pertinent to, to be in prayer and um, to be praying even if you don't see the results. There's something um, very, very powerful about prayer, and I think there's a uniting in that as well. So I just want to encourage you with that, and I'll sprinkle uh, this this into the into the message a little bit throughout, but um, I wanted to make sure that we all are um, holding both tensions and that we're in prayer and that we're we're being the church. So I encourage you to lean into that. Okay, so uh, okay, here we go. So this topic of prayer, I think sometimes we can make light of it, and today I'm going to do anything but that. I'm going to really challenge us to to look at prayer very very differently. Um, I think that a lot of times we just scratch the surface with prayer uh, and we kind of call it a day. But here are some questions to really think about. Like, what, what does prayer really mean? Uh, how do we be more effective in our prayer lives? How pow- powerful can it be? And also the mystery of it. I think that there's, there's a lot of mystery when it comes to prayer. And so if we're being honest, the Bible is somewhat of a paradox when it comes to prayer. It can be the most beautiful and powerful thing people ever experience. And at the same time, it can be frustrating, it can be depressing, and it can be confusing. And I want you to hold on to that for a second. Like think about your own, your own time when you've been in prayer and you've had some of the mountain highs, right? it's been exhilarating, you've seen God come through in amazing ways in your life. And at other times, it's as if he's been distant, hasn't heard you, he's not there. And so ask some of these questions. Why do some prayers seem to be answered and some don't? Is God sometimes listening and at other times too busy answering other people's prayers? How does my sinfulness get in the way of God answering or not answering my prayers? You know, some of the verses that come to mind is like, if, if I had faith of mustard seed, you know, be able to move mountains. Or ask me for anything in my name and it will be given unto you. And then you have to step back and ask yourself, has this really been your experience? And if it has, like how often, right? It's, it's one of these things like um, it, you could have these times where you've had a prayer and uh, you were like, you were so amazed and blown away. And you're like, God is so good. His grace, his power, like all these things. But then it could be literally the same day. Um, and you're, you're praying about something else and it's like, come on, like, I feel like there's, there's no headway that you're not getting anywhere with this. And it's like God's not even listening. So how come he cared about this thing or this person and then seemingly over here doesn't seem to care about him? And so I think it's something that we need to wrestle with. And um, some of you may hold this view. This is an interesting thing. And, and I've actually um, found myself saying this before. But some of us, you know, when we deal with these tough issues, we've gone to the thing of like, Oh, God always answers prayer. And sometimes the answer is yes. And sometimes the answer is no. And sometimes the answer is wait. And it's kind of like this cute little package deal that helps us not have to wrestle with the deeper issues. And, um, and I've been guilty of this, you know, and, and, and there's truth to it. So like if, if you really hold on to this as your personal view, I'm just like maybe asking you to expand that a little bit and to, to be more thoughtful and to be willing to lean into maybe more of a dialogue around it because maybe it's not as simple as that. And if this is your view, recognize that there's a lot of people that have been hurt by this in the sense of they've, uh, they've left God 
or they've left the church over this because God didn't answer their prayer. And that's how they view it. And so our ability to, to have um, some good thoughts on this and to wrestle with the deeper issues, it kind of unites us. And I think sometimes as, as Christ, Christ followers, our inability uh, to, to dialogue in a way where it's not a us and them, but it's a leaning into these difficult conversations makes a big difference. And if I'm so, you know, trite in my thoughts on this, it's like, you know, I'm good regardless of what happens. I think that turns people off. And it's not helping people draw close to God. It's asking the saints, see, that they don't, it doesn't even make sense to them. And so I feel like we have to do a better job of articulating why we believe what we believe and what does that look like. So let me, uh, we're going to read a psalm. And before I do, I want to talk about King David a little bit. Um, David was a person of prayer and he was considered to be a man um, after God's own heart. And that in itself I have problems with. I've always wrestled with that because he was an adulterer and he was also a conspirator of murder. And so how in the world can be a man after God's own heart? Um, And that would be a rabbit trail that we could go down. It's probably another teaching for another time. But we also know that David was both a warrior. um, You know, he was a he was a gladiator. He was a warrior. And at the same time, he was a psalmist. You know, he's a musician and he was a writer and a poet and like all these. It's very interesting, the dynamic of who he was as a person. Um, But he seemed to have a a way with prayer and a a really interesting way of connecting with God at a a profound level. So I want you to take a look at what he wrote. And it's Psalm 13, 1 through 3. And it says this. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? And that's a way of saying like, uh, that God seems distant and his presence is absent. So that was, a, that was a phrase that they would use, like this idea of hiding one's face was as if God's presence wasn't being realized. And it says, how long must I wrestle with my thoughts? And just pause there a second. Like, I want you to put yourself into the scriptures. Like, those long nights that you've had when it's like you can't shut down your thoughts. You can't go to sleep at night because what you're experiencing is so overwhelming and, and this is the place where David is at. And, and sometimes we have to really lean into, um, the, the, when we're reading scripture, that it's not this book that was written all these years ago, but it's really present to us today because we've all had these moments. So how long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer. Lord, my God, like, look at me like this idea, like show your face, reveal your presence, be with me, God. Like there's this, this is desire in, in David that, um, you know, this idea like, Lord, you're my God. And yet I'm wrestling and, and my thoughts, I can't, I can't stay a, a, ahead of them. And my heart is breaking and it seems like you've turned your face from me. How long? And then it says, give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. This idea like I can't take it. I can't take feeling like you're far from me. And that feeling is like it's death to me. And I don't know about you, but I've, I haven't necessarily experienced this myself to the depths of what I've heard other people talk about. But I've heard other people talk about how it's been months where they felt they were in a wilderness. They felt they were in a desert. They felt like God had completely left them. And if you've ever come to know the sweetness and the goodness and the love of God in a real personal and experiential way, and then to have it kind of removed from you and for you to feel completely abandoned, it leaves you in turmoil. It leaves you with, how am I going to uh, ever get through this? And the one person in God that you felt you could rely on and and was a foundation for you has now just been rattled and shaken. And so you're left with this question, how long, Lord? So David is presenting with us, and I'd say even more, but I'm just going to talk about two things. But he's talking about two very, very uh, big issues and questions for us to wrestle with. The first one is, what do I do when it feels like God isn't present? It's a big question. What do I do when it feels like God isn't present. And then the second one is, 
what do I do when God doesn't answer my prayers? What do you all do? And so, Kara, if anything comes in there, I'd love to hear some of your thoughts on this. What do you do when it's been so long since you've been praying and all you've gotten is nothing? Nothing seems to be happening. It doesn't seem like God is listening. Certainly doesn't seem like he's doing anything about it. And it may even seem like he isn't listening or doesn't care. That's a tough place to be. When I first read the scripture, I was sitting there and go, it was like, look on me and answer, Lord my God. Like part of me wanted to say like, like grab him by the shirt and say, look at me. Like with like this emphasis, dang it, like come on God, look at me. Answer me. I can't take it anymore. You know, and I was like, could, I don't know. I don't know what he was feeling, but there's a part of me that says like that's a, that's a response. It's a genuine response that, that all of us could have. And at, and at the same time, it could be, God, please look on me. Like, look on me. It's been too long. And I can't do it anymore. You know what I mean? Like, it, and it could be a lot of other things too, right? But I want you to put yourself into this. And I feel like David, there was something beautiful about David that he was so raw and honest. And I feel like th- it's something refreshing about that. Like, I don't know about you, but like for me, like sometimes I get turned off by Christians because they make it seem like everything's just fine all the time. It's too flowery. It's too, it's too easy. And I don't feel the angst. I don't feel the wrestling with and it, and it feels like it, it slights somehow the grace and the, the pain and the suffering that Jesus went through. And so I, I would encourage us to, um, to, to see how being raw and honest can be so refreshing both to, to God, to oneself, and to the people around us and the people that are wrestling with God. Um, and so I think this is a key. Like this is one thing for us to wrestle with in our prayer life is that it's okay to be raw. It's okay to be honest with God and to, to, to almost like expect that there's a wrestling with. Um, and I, I think we have a, a question, Kara? Um, okay. Does she need a microphone when she talks? Can you guys hear her? Or? Mm-hmm. It's okay, I'll repeat it. It's okay. Can, is that working? Like, if, go ahead, say it again, just so we can. One of our participants said, it really is his way. I've seen it happen this, this year so many times. I didn't understand until later. I thought I was alone, but his answers were there. Hindsight is twenty twenty. the aha moment. Hmm. Yeah, and, and I appreciate that. I think that, I think that there's always something beautiful in, in hindsight. And I think that's part of our story. I think that when we're sharing with other folks, especially people that wouldn't consider themselves to be Christians, and they're, they're asking these questions about prayer, um, I think it's really important to articulate it in the, in the moment, like in the pain of, of the moment, and um, not jump to the conclusion. And I think that's, Carol, I think that's what we often do, is that we we jump to the other side of like the, the hindsight is twenty twenty, and that's what we articulate and that's what we communicate to to others. And I think that we don't often talk about the process and the journey and the long nights. Um, and so although I really appreciate it and I do think that many of us will see um, what we would say God moving in our lives where it doesn't seem like he was in the moment and we can look back on that time, even if it's a year from now or two years from now, um, and then we can say, geez, it seems like God was doing something there. Um, there's an exercise that, I've, that I did years and years ago, but I think it's very um, practical and it makes a big difference. So if you want to take this on, but it's a, it's a thing where you, you look at your, over your life's time and you look at the different events that you've gone through and you just start putting them down, like the things that matter to you, the things both good and bad, the things that uh, were impactful to who you have become. And when I did that, I think I was in my mid-30s, and when I was looking back, then you put them into chapters and you start to see like the good and the bad and what was going on in your life. And I didn't become a Christian until I was 21, but I went through a lot of loss in my first like 
from three to 18 and three was my parents getting divorced and then age, age 18 losing different people and, and whatnot and dealing with loss. And so during that time, not being a Christian, I would not have ever said to anyone like, geez, God was doing something in my life. But now as a, in my mid thirties, looking back, I actually saw that uh, potentially God was using some of those experiences that I had gone through to actually shape me for, for what I did do for a living. This idea of being a pastor and being able to care for people and, and be with people in their pain. Um, I feel my going through that actually helps me to be more empathetic and, and understand what that pain is like. So, um, but I, I guess I want to caution us to, to jump to the end too quickly and to, to talk more about, you know, when we pray, there's a, uh, <laughs> there's a lot of ambiguity and there, it, there can be a lot of tension in that. Um, so what the hell? Okay. How's that? A little mic change. <laughs> All right. So yeah, keep the questions coming. I love that. Um, and then so like this, these beg the questions of uh, when we talk about being raw and honest, how long do I have to wait? How long do I have to pray? <laughs> like, I, forget, I, I don't want to pray anymore. Like, I prayed for this person enough. Um, why aren't you doing something, God? It's easy to feel rejected or forgotten by God when we're in this place. And so this is the sort of stuff that I want you to hold on to as we talk about it. And to really recognize, like, this is a tough place to be. Um, and keep it real in your own life. So be thinking about um, what are the couple of things that you have experienced where crap happens. And... And even right now, like in light of the coronavirus, it's like this, th this is, um, seems like it's going to be for a, a, a long, long period of time. And these questions are going to linger. And there's going to be a lot of folks who um, are going to be having this conversation. And this is why I think it's so important for us as a community um, at Stone Coast to really grapple with this and to figure out ways in which we can build bridges with people to encourage conversation and to, to be able to talk about, well, what do you do when, when you pray and it, God didn't show up? What do you do when you, you didn't get answers? And so this is, a, this is a great conversation to lean into. And if you find this challenging because you've had certain beliefs in your Christianity, that's fine. Just be open to, to, to learning anew. So what do we do when we're in this place? Do we throw up our hands and, and stop praying? Do we give up? Do we blame God? Do we, do we judge others as if they don't have enough faith and that's why things aren't going that way? So why does unanswered prayer happen? And this is a great question. And um, I look forward to like, you know, throwing out different things to consider, but I'm not sure you're going to love the answers. So let's frame it. So I'm not talking about prayer in the sense of like, um, you know, let's pray for your, your favorite sports team to win or, or praying for you to win the lottery or talking about and praying for trivial matters and things that, quite honestly, I don't think God really gives a rip about. You know, like there's, there's certain things where it's like um, this is not the kinds of prayers that I'm talking about. I'm talking about like when life happens, when the crap hits the fan and you, you don't know what to do and you've been at a loss. You know, how do I pray when, when you get that phone call, you get that diagnosis? How do I pray when I've been praying for my teenager for years and he or she is still making reckless decisions and you can't go to sleep at night? How do we pray when we've lost our job and unemployment has run out and you have no idea how to make ends meet? How do you pray when the coronavirus hits and it's a pandemic around the world and we're living in the unknown? Did you have another Prayers aren't answered. Uh, just a couple of points here. Um, personally, all the health crap um, I've been through, and it looks, it's like this virus is testing how well I've handled it. Um, some questions, why am, I, why am I in the middle of it? Where do I turn? God, what do you want from me? And um, I struggle knowing that God may not want what I want. Hmm. That's a, those are great thoughts. Where to begin? <laughs> those are like six questions at once. <laughs> um, you know, 
some of that line of thinking can be dangerous, right? Because we start to think about how, like, I must be going through this because God is trying to teach me this lesson. And I'd be cautious to, to, to go there. And then at the same time, I do think there's a tension to manage there because there, there's always this idea that there could be a test. Um, I think sometimes we, we want the answers so badly um, that we start to internalize for, our, for ourselves um, and it taints who the picture of God is um, because we're trying to find the answer so, because we don't like to not be in control. Um, and so whenever I feel like my life is out of control, which our health issues are huge. I had shared a few weeks ago where for, for about eight years I had, I would suggest chronic back issues. And, and when you're dealing with something chronic, um, there is this, um, hmm, how do I say this? There is a time where you keep pursuing and fighting and wrestling with and asking God for the, for the miracle and the healing. And then you have to also juxtapose that with, well, Paul always had that thorn in his side. Like it, it wasn't removed. Like there's going to be times when, and I don't have a good answer for it. I don't know why that happens to certain people, but there comes that time where it's like, okay, God, I get it. And, and I know that you're with me in this. I know that this isn't, you're not somehow punish me, punishing me for this. Um, we do live in a fallen and broken world. And, and so there's going to be uh, things that just are. And I know that that's, that sucks, right? Chronic pain is one of those things that just suck and there's no easy way around it. Um, but I'd be cautious to, to uh, draw our view of God from that pain. And so, um, so there you go. Okay. Uh, let's see. Oh, so I, I'm going to throw out what I consider to be a, a Christian conundrum. You know, like <laughs> this is maybe goes a little bit with that question too, Kara. So when you have truly lived a good and godly life, like, you know what I mean? There's some people in our lives that we know, like you look at this person, you're like this person, they are such a good, good, good person. And they've lived a godly life. And, and meaning people would describe you as a great person of God. You're kind, you're humble, pure and loving. And then crap happens. And then you, you're left with like, God, I have done so much right and I have lived according to your ways for so long and now this happens to me? It seems so cruel. A little bit of like Job. Tell me why this has happened to me and you didn't answer my prayers. And I put like, this is so dangerous because people have left the faith over this. So if you wrestle with this or this was your experience, it's important to set biblical expectations. So one thing is recognize that we do live in the experience of the fall. We do live in the impacts of a broken world. And um, the Bible does say that we will have trouble. You know what I mean? It doesn't say like, oh, if you follow me, if you do these things and you live for me, everything is going to be fine. It doesn't say that. It actually says that you will have trouble in this world. And then look at Jesus and his disciples. All of them were martyred. You know what I mean? Like, it's like there, there's, there's not a promise that if you say yes to Christ, like your life is just going to go as planned. Um, and then this kind of goes back to, to last week because when my value as a person comes outside of me, even to the point of your relationship with God, meaning this, if I'm good, then you'll bless me. That's me trying to be in control. And I do this. I think we all have a tendency and a propensity to do this. It's like when my life is out of control, I have to do what I want. Like I do whatever I can to maintain control. And I'll even look outside of that and say, God, like I have done. It's like the, the, um, the prodigal son story. And you had the elder brother who stayed home and, and did that which was right. And he obeyed. And it seemed like, why is this happening to him? Why isn't he getting the blessings? You know, like his younger, his younger brother comes home and they throw a party for him. And here he is. Why hasn't he been given a party? And it's like, this is the idea of looking outside of yourself for your worth and recognizing, wait a second, this, this is um, our searching for us to be in control and we're using God or, or using him as a way of a scapegoat. Okay? So question for you, Kara, to put out there. And obviously, if you had to describe the value of prayer in your life to a friend who didn't believe in God, what would you say? Yep. 
if you had to describe the value of prayer in your life to a friend who didn't believe in God, what would you say? So I want us to kind of be coached as Christ followers to be able to have conversations around this. So I'm going to let some of you, hopefully you'll write in. Um, how would you describe the value of prayer? So for me, because I'm going to wait for some re responses, it depends on when you would have asked me. And like I said earlier, like I could have fallen into that, that thing of God always answers prayers, yes, no, or wait. Recently, I've been processing this, and I think the, like, I do think it helps. Like the longer you live life, the more experiences that you go through, the more you've had to wrestle with this. Um, I was going to say this at the end, but maybe I'll say it now. But Diane and I went through a time when um, she was pregnant with our first child. Um, and I, rem <laughs> I remember the night where it was early on in the pregnancy, and, um, and Diane was bleeding. And obviously she was very emotional and uh, we were concerned. It was the unknown of what was happening. We were laying in bed and it was late at night. And I found myself like, you know, this is the beauty of prayer because when you have nothing else to do that you can control, you can turn to the Father. And as I was praying, I just felt like God was saying, I got you. And I saw a picture of his hands just kind of like holding it was like he was holding Diane. He was holding the baby within her. And I found a sense of peace come over me. But what I didn't realize, and I feel like this is the paradox, this is the tension to manage. Like Diane really believes that she had, that she had twins. And that one of them didn't make it that night. And so on one hand, you know, you praise God. Thank you, God, for, for saving life, you know. And then on the other hand, you have to look and say, well, what do you say? And how do you wrestle with that potentially life was taken? When you have nights like that, it's not simple enough to just say, just have faith or or God is good. You know, like people say that God is good. God is good all the time. And I'm like, so I get that. But at the same time, it's not helpful in that moment. And so I feel like when we talk about the value of prayer and with other people, be cautious not to build up like the glory of it. Like, oh my gosh, you wouldn't believe how unbelievable prayer is to me. And God answers my prayers. And this is what it's like. Because that's not most people's reality. I got you Kleenex. It's like it's. Can we just can we just um, recognize the tension there? Can we t can we recognize the being real and raw? <laughs> Sorry. I think people who might not have a relationship with God or who've been turned off by Christianity or Christians think they would appreciate more a very real approach, an authentic approach that, that looks at both the good and the bad. Anything on that? No. So I would suggest that many of us probably don't have a great prayer life. And I'm making an assumption there, so I could be offending some of you. And I apologize if I am. But I think this is true. So I'll say probably don't have a great prayer life and many prayers go unanswered. Or we have appeased ourselves by saying God said wait or no. So we wouldn't have to deal with the issue that our prayers have been ineffective. <laughs> I said, ouch. <laughs> I know this stings a little bit. <laughs> but I'm with you on this. If we really look hard at this, then that would cause us to have to look more deeply into our relationship with God and ultimately look more closely at our own lives. What do I mean by that? So if you're talking about your relationship with God, you have to wrestle with this idea like, why God? You know, I'm looking at you, Brian, like why your cousin? You know, when you, when you called me that night and told me about your cousin, like you, you, you can't be human and not like ask those questions. You know what I mean? And to really wrestle, like why did that happen? Um, and that happens every day, 
right? Every moment of our lives is people around the world that tragedy is happening to. Who is God in my life? How do I view God? Like when those things happen, what's your view of him? Do you sit there and go, God, he is a loving father? Or do you question that? How do I interact with God through my pain? What's my relationship with God when he doesn't answer? Hmm. And then how about with your relationship with yourself? This is difficult, and, and a lot of people don't like to talk about it. We're not going to go deep into this, but it's real. Like, how I live matters. Because I've, you can question this or not, but I think it's scriptural, that sin impacts our prayer life, you know? Um, so do we really want to look at who we are in Christ and where we fall short and the correlation it has on our prayer life? You know what I mean? You have to be very self-aware and willing to go through a pruning process and actually want to do that. You, because God doesn't force. I don't believe he does. That neon enough all power thing was very, very critical for us to think about. I think God comes in in a very loving way, and I think the Holy Spirit convicts us and, and brings things to our awareness. But we have the choice to say, do I want to work on this area of my life or not? And, and when we say yes, we're saying yes to potentially a, a painful process. And the pruning process and the refining process can be painful. So I recognize that this is hard stuff, but I don't want to take it easy on us. I think it's too important when we think about how people have um, run away from God and how they look at their lives and, and they listen to how we process issues and then they draw conclusions based on that. Right or wrong, it's true. Many times they draw a conclusion that God, that this God stuff really isn't worth it. And I believe it's so that it's so critical that we wrestle with this and are able to communicate it well to others. Because here it is, prayer is powerful. It's beautiful. It's our lifeline to God and developing our relationship with him. And there are many reasons why prayers go unanswered. And so, Kara, here's another question. What are the reasons for unanswered prayer? I would just love to hear people's comments on that. And if you all have thoughts on that in here, let me know. So what are, what are reasons for unanswered prayer? Why do people, when they wrestle, say, like, I prayed today or I prayed last month and my prayers did not go, uh, I didn't get answers. So why? Why does that happen? Anyone have answers here? Okay. Okay. So there's been conversations online about his timing. And, and again, I'm going to be a little bit harsh. <laughs> I, I, I feel that's a cop-out, you know, like, I, and, and I get it. Um, I think that uh, there is a very, very, tr there's a truism there about God's timing. We'll, we'll hit at that the, at the end. But at the same time, how, how do we deal with that in the moment? You know what I mean? So like I, I appreciate that thought, but it's like, okay, so what do we do then? And, and if prayer isn't effective, why do we do it? So what do you guys think? Anyone have like popcorn answers as far as like just what are some of the reasons for unanswered prayer? Anyone? I think it's our, we put our own expectations on it. We put our own expectations on it. And what do you mean by that? Like as far as like... Um, Okay, so we have an expectation that what we pray for, it will come to, to fruition. And so so then you're let down, is that what you're saying? So then there's a letdown when it doesn't happen, okay? I would say, and going off what Mark said also, is um, there's a letdown because we think that this is like, we, we see prayer as like a, a spell that is supposed to happen. And we don't see it, like prayer doesn't work. In other words, like prayer is supposed to work, not a worship. And that instead of seeing God as a person that's talking to you, and then yep. treating prayer as some sort of like vending machine. Yeah. <laughs> Put one in, take one out. Um, on the flip side, sometimes when your prayer is answered, say four or five years later, then you get the clarity of why. Yep. Okay. 
yeah, so sometimes it could be four or five years later um, when the prayer seems to be answered and you can look back and go, oh, geez, now I get it. Um, so if there's other things that come through, Carol, let me know. But I'm just going to throw, th this is what I'm about to say could be an entire series. And so I'm not going to do it justice, but and if we want to do a series, you guys can take notes and tell me we should do this. But like the first one, and I'll talk a little bit about e some of these, like God's will. You know, like sometimes it's God's will that this thing happens or doesn't happen. Um, the faith of the prayer, meaning the person who's praying, and the faith of the person being prayed for. Our sinful lifestyle. Lack of persistence. Treating God as if he's a genie in the bottle. And I was kind of thinking about when you said that, Brian. Like if I just rub it, you know, three wishes, here we go. The number of people praying. You know, like if you had 100 people praying or 1,000 people praying, I think that there's... Um, that, that matters. So if you're just praying on your own, maybe that's the reason why you're not getting your prayers answered. And then a, a human free will. Uh, you know, I put people's salvation, people set free from addiction, etc. We can pray and pray and pray, but sometimes people just keep making decisions that will prevent them from coming to God or prevent them from being healed from an addiction. Um, so let me talk about a couple of these because I, I think that uh, some of these can be dangerously tainted. So for example, if we have this idea like unanswered prayers happen because it's God's will. So here it is. I do believe that to be true. And at the same time, we have to be very, very careful with that line of thinking. Because if God wills it, that means all the, all the stuff that happens in the world, going back to week one, is that he caused it all. Right? And so is it sometimes God's will? And, and if you look into, you think we get answers, Mark, when we talk about like four years later. If God's outside of time and outside of space and being able to see the whole picture, right? Like we, we don't. We see it for what it is right now. But, but I, I often look at, um, what's that movie, the Christmas movie? <laughs> A Beautiful Life, is that it? A Wonderful, A Wonderful Life. Life. You know, it's the idea of like being able to look at all the decisions that happened along the way. Had I changed that one decision, it would have had a different ripple effect. If I had changed this decision, it would have had a different ripple effect. You know, and like when God knows all of that, and it's like, so I do look at God as a loving father. And, and in the big, 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 bigness of that, yes, could his will have been done? Yes. When someone, Ian, goes through something painful, and, and I say that to Ian, God, that's God's will, that is so unhelpful. It's like probably the most painful thing I could say because it's rattling him and his faith and, and everything that he believes about God. And, and yet, okay, so there's this paradox, there's this tension to manage in that. And the other one that I, 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 don't, I have a love-hate relation with this is the idea of the, if you had enough faith, right? I just said that your faith does matter. So if your prayers are not being answered, it does have to do with faith. And at the same time, it may not. There could be a hundred different reasons why. And so am I always going to encourage people to grow in their faith? Yes. But again, if Diane goes through something and her life's falling apart, and I said, honey, if you just had enough faith, you'd be fine. That's not helpful. It's actually quite hurtful. And if you're talking to people um, that don't have a Christian worldview, it's like, it's ridiculous. Like, it's like, how can you say that, right? And how can you blame that person for what happened, right? So you have to be very, very careful with this. Um, and, and, but yet, this is what I really love about this kind of series and this kind of discussion, that we can wrestle with this stuff. <laughs> and then I'm going to be a little bit um, hard on us here. The last one I was thought an example of lacking of persistence. Okay, um, I was reading this great book on on an Islamic community, and uh, so there was some Christians that were part of this Islamic community, and when they prayed, they would pray for twenty four hours straight. At one point, they prayed for a month, and it was on a. Uh, they had the whole village praying, so every minute of every day for a month, there was prayer. And then on the back side of that, in this story, they talked about um, these amazing things that happen. And I said, we always question, why doesn't God do things like we see in the scriptures? Why doesn't he do them today? And I said, they go, because we would never do that. When's the last time you've prayed for 24 hours? When's the last time you've gotten a group of people together and say, you know what? We have to pray nonstop for a month because come what may, this matters. And I'm willing to do whatever it takes to move the hand of God to make a difference. We don't do that. And because we're, we won't do that or we refuse to do that or we're too lazy to do that, maybe that's somehow 
related to why we don't have prayers answered. And I know that's harsh, but we have the story of the persistent widow in the scripture. <laughs> it's like she just kept persisting and persisting and persisting and persisting. And finally, the judge relents, okay, fine. Right? And it's a picture of, of God and his people that God can be um, persuaded. And I want you to, this is one of the keys today is our prayers are persuasive, but not coercive. Okay? Our prayers are persuasive, but not coercive. And I believe that scripture shows us that God can be influenced. We have the stories in, in Moses where like people's lives were spared because he was praying, but God save these, but not this many, but not this many, but not this many. And God moved on that. And then we have, um, you know, this idea of the picture of God in Jesus that he doesn't use this Neanderthal power like we've talked about very often, but I do believe our prayers are persuasive or influential and have a tangible effect. It can be very hard to see at times, and there's still much that we don't understand. And that's okay. It doesn't have to be like black and white. It's, it's a relationship, like Brian was talking about earlier. It's a lot of it's built on our relationship with God and trusting that, like, that things will come about in his ways over time, but we have to wrestle with that in the here and the now as well. All right, so another thought is this. There's no magic formula um, there's no script that I can give you because it really has to do with a relationship with God. Okay, Christianity is built on our relationship of being with the Holy One, to be with the presence of God the Father, to, to learn and, and to study the person of Christ and to be led and filled with the breath of the Holy Spirit. So prayer is both listening and talking to God. It's, it's co- having a conversation with Him. So I, I put like, it's very similar to conversing with your spouse. You know, like we ought to be curious, but we can also be persuasive. We can be influential. We can be loving. We can listen. We can go back and forth on things. We can disagree and, and work through it. We can be leaning in. We can be wrestling with. But with God, there's like, there's this other thing about the fear and reverence and awe. So we should never lose sight of that either. Like we are pleading to the God of the universe. We are going before God to say, God, I beg you, I implore you you to to do something in this situation. So I encourage us to do that with all that we're worth because you never know what God will do and how he might show up. We have more of a posture of humility and respect with God. And yet I think it's okay to be real and authentic with our emotions and our feelings. And I believe like if you want to spend any time like looking at scriptures, look at the Psalms because the Psalms do this. They're so real and authentic where it's like on one hand, the, the Psalm starts off and it's putting forth the case of like why I'm in so much pain and where are you, God? And how long? Like we talked about earlier with David. But then if you keep reading the Psalms, it's almost always at the end of the Psalm, but, but you're God. But I get it. Like I'm not God and you are. And I'm going to yield and I'm going to surrender and I'm going to trust There's something beautiful about our relationship with God and as it pertains to prayer. So to your point, it's not about just getting answers. It's about being with. All right, and then there's another part of this. It's like there's a good versus evil. And I don't know that we like to talk about this a lot. But in scriptures, it's pretty pretty evident. And it's a result of um, a big component of unanswered prayer is, is simply because we live in a fallen and broken world. Um, We do live in the in-between times, right? Like I believe that Christ through the cross and resurrection, that he defeated evil and sin and death, and he's victorious in all these ways, but we live in the in-between times of when he's coming back once and for all. We have to recognize that. And in this in-between times, there's a spiritual battle going on, and it's a very real battle between good and evil. So here's a couple of quick verses for you. 1 Peter 5.8. Be sober-minded, be watchful, Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Ephesians 6, 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And then lastly, James 4, 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So this is like, 
a very real picture that the scriptures recognize that there is a battle going on. And there's actually a story. I don't want to go too far into it, but it's out of the book of Daniel. And it, it talks about like how prayer was answered in that moment. And yet it took 21 days for the answer to be realized because the prince of Persia, this evil force, if you will, held up the archangel, Michael. And, and so there was a battle that took place and it apparently took place over 21 days. And I don't quite get that. That's kind of a, a strange and interesting story, but it highlights like there's this spiritual world. There's a spiritual battle going on and that good and evil are, are doing this. They're coming against one another. And so the prayer seemingly was answered in that moment. And yet it wasn't realized until 21 days later. And so how does that work? I don't know. Um, but there's something about the relationship that plays into that, that I'm going to continue to wrestle with God. I'm going to continue to walk with God. I'm going to continue to, to believe in him, um, trusting that he has my best in mind. Okay, so I believe that prayer is vital. It's pivotal. It's amazing. It's beautiful. It's transformative. I believe it works. I believe it makes a difference. I believe it's our lifeline to God. And I believe it's attention to manage. I don't know why our prayers go unanswered at times. And I think it's critical for us to pray and to get better at praying. I think as disciples, we have to look closely at ourselves and say, how can I become more effective? How can I grow in this area of my life? So if you're in the middle of crap happens, I am. I'm sorry. And I know what I have to say isn't adequate because you're in the throes of it right now. I do believe that no matter what we see and experience, I believe to the core of my being that God is right there with us in the midst of our pain, our sorrow, and our suffering. Another thing that I think we need to contend with is this idea that God loved us so much that he pursued us, that he, he didn't stop at any length to send his own son very intentionally, very lovingly, very sacrificially, he sent Jesus to earth to experience this life with us. He didn't withhold anything from him. Jesus, he willingly went to the cross to suffer. And he did this knowing he would defeat the evil one and defeat pain and suffering. And it's true, we live in the in-between times of the broken world and our promised new creation. Go ahead, Kara. <laughs> yeah great yeah yeah say that say that one again use the microphone please oh you lost your spot are there some prayers that god can't answer because it would go against his nature so i, I think i would say yes it depends on what you're praying for like if you're praying for someone to get murdered or something like that, right? Um, I, I don't know really the context of what they're, how they're expressing that, but yes, I would suggest that if you're praying for, for this ill and these evils to happen upon other people, that God would not answer that prayer. Um, I also think that there's times when God, uh, again, knowing the big picture, I look at sometimes my, my as a parent myself, I know this is a limiting analogy, but I think it's somewhat helpful is that like, you know what I mean? Like when my kids are young and you have kids, you know what's best for them, right? To a certain extent, you know what's best for them. And, and they don't know that yet. And so you're saying certain things to them and you're doing certain things to them and making decisions based on you know what's best for them. Uh, and they might cry like heck and like fight you and all this different stuff because they don't know yet that you're doing it out of love. They just didn't get what they wanted. And I think sometimes we're like that. Like we, we want what we want when we want it. So when we don't get it, we look and we blame others. We blame God. Um, and so, you know, I think it is important that we recognize that it's going to line up with Scripture. It's going to line up with God's character. Um, those are definitely there. So if you expounded on that by saying um, specifically prayer, praying for someone to believe. Oh, yeah. Great. So, so th then... I, that's within his character. So I would say that he definitely longs for that to happen. Now you have to ask yourself all these other 
these other reasons why prayer goes unanswered, right? And I've just put in a, a, a litany of different ways to think about that. And I definitely talked, I, I had mentioned that earlier about one's salvation. And, you know, we can be praying and praying for years and years and years. And that person, that person has free will, you know? And, um, and again, without that Neanderthal power, God is not going to come in and make that person follow him. But, and I would say at the same time, though, keep praying. Right. I mean, we've heard stories of people taking 20 years and then finally, you know, their eyes were opened and they received the Lord. And and it's this beautiful thing. Um, so it's just hard when it hasn't happened yet. And we've been praying for so long. But that's, that's one of those I would suggest those are one of the things that persistency is so critical that we continue to pray and pray and pray um, and that we trust God. But I don't think that's the reason why he doesn't answer. I think that is inside of his, his will and his character that he would love for that to happen. But he's not going to force someone to do so. All right. Let's see, running out of time. Okay, so we have to talk about the promises of Scripture versus my reality at times in James 5, 13 through 18. James 5, 13 through 18. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. Why I say it it helps, (laughs) right? To have faith helps. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Something to our sinfulness there. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. So there's this balancing out that's happening here. I believe many of us have seen God answer his prayers in an amazing way. But this is for when they're not. So it begs the question, should I lower my expectations of prayer since we see it being effective so seldom? So Mark, I don't know if that was what you were kind of talking about. Like it's like if you take your line of thinking and then take it one step further, say, well, if that's true, then I'm just going to lower my expectation, right? Because I don't want to be hurt again. I don't want to be let down again. And I don't want to blame God, right? <laughs> so there's a, there's a, a paradox there. Um, and this isn't something to take lightly because many a person has stood before God and demanded an answer, right? Some of you, I'm sure, have, have met people where they're like, I got to this place and I needed an answer. And I said to God, if you do X, then I'll believe in you. And if you don't come through, I'm done. And we know, I would suggest we each know a few people that that's happened and they're no longer walking with God. And I think we've seen both sides of it as well, uh, where some people have actually come to faith in that, right? Where that answer happened. And I said, that doesn't make sense to me. And it's a tension to manage. So many have prayed and didn't get the answer they, wa- they wanted and they have rejected the faith. We must walk humbly with our God and manage this tension while still upholding the essence and purity of the scriptures, which put forth that prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Go ahead. So there seems to be... Um a lot of folks asking questions like this. It's a little out of context, but the timing is tricky with Facebook Live. Um, some people are struggling with this concept. Does God actually not answer prayers? Or is the, the answer just no or not now? I don't know that I believe he ever just doesn't answer. Yeah. So I think I am, that's going to be part of the conclusion. I, I'm setting it up so that we, I do believe that God answers prayers. And he answers all of our prayers. I think that setting up this is understanding that when we are praying, it's as if our prayers go unanswered. And what do I do in the midst of that? And how do I wrestle with God in the midst of that? Um, There's going to be some things that we will not know this side of earth, this side of heaven, excuse me. Um, And it's, And it's a painful thing, but that's why we have to keep it in perspective. So let me, I'll get to that. And then if I don't, I want to reiterate that a little bit. Um, But under this idea of like what the the scriptures promise and the reality of these times, I kind of put, I said an illustration of me and Diane. And I said, I don't always get what I want. Actually, I seldom ever get what I want. (laughs) Just kidding. But if my relationship with Diane was only 
or even primarily based upon whether or not I got what I wanted when I went before her or made my request, then most of you would say that's silly. This is kind of like to your point. If our relationship was just built on that and I just went to her over and over again expecting to get the answers and expect what I wanted to get, then somehow I made it about her and that she was the wrong person. But we say this about our relationship with God. When I don't get the answers I want, then maybe I don't need to pray as much or maybe I lower the bar on my expectations and I become apathetic and content in a bad way. Like it can sometimes actually turn us off from praying more because of our experiences and because of our expectations. Maybe we need to come to God new and afresh, filled with expectation and mature enough in our faith and relationship to handle things when they go unanswered. And I'll say seemingly unanswered. And Ian, if you have a point on that, just make sure you, you know, but you have to do it in two minutes or less. That's it. That's the big problem, right? <laughs> We have a whole nother episode. Um, but would you, would you say that do prayers do go answered? Yes or no? I think it's about the framework. Of what, where that question is coming from. If you're coming from a framework of he's a genie in a bottle, then you're definitely going to regret it. Okay. But if you're coming at it with a framework of that we are in a battle and that other forces can come against your prayer, come against someone's um, uh, selfish heart that's pushing them in that direction, that's what you're battling against. Hence the persistence, hence the prayer in community, hence the... Uh, so it seems like the prayer is going unanswered, the but there's all these other factors going on. of forces yeah. in a battle. Yeah. So, and you are a privileged participant in that. Right, and so that's that idea of the influence and being able to persuade right. but not coerce. This is why we're talking about evil and the spiritual battle, right? There's a lot of factors that we're bringing into this. Uh, I just wanted to see your quick, that's great. I know this is like, <laughs> you would love to go on for another whole hour here. Um, let me just wrap up with this. Um, I also find this to be a beautiful picture and part of the good news is that we're never alone and that Jesus intercedes on our behalf. I've always found this to be unbelievable. In Romans 8, 34 to 39, Jesus, I'm, I'm skipping a, a couple of verses, but Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of the, of the Father and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? So let me stop there for a second. When we think about our relationship with God, are we thinking about what we get out of it and it's a bless me relationship or is it simply a relationship? Like I love being with Diane, just be with her. I love being with God because I want to be with him. I don't have expectations of getting things from him. I think that's a beautiful part of a relationship that, th that at times you, you get these things and at times you don't get these things. But the fact that he is interceding on our behalf, I find great hope in that. And then continuing on, it says, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So if, if that's our place, that we just long to have a relationship with God, if without expectation of getting stuff, right? But being with, then nothing can separate us. It's the fact that when I don't get what I want, that's when the tension happens. And it violates the relationship some way. And it takes away with the relationship. And it, and it has everything to do, a lot to do with who I am and my own insecurity, my own humanness, and my own human nature. And I don't know how this works, but I find reassurance knowing that Christ is before the Father and is inced, interceding on our behalf. It's active. It's influential. It's effective. And it's powerful. But each of you has to come to a place to decide what you're convinced of. I'm convinced that nothing will separate me or us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. So even when life falls apart around me, I want to choose to believe God is present. I choose to believe that God can change my circumstances. And when he doesn't, I need to wrestle with that. I need to be real with that. I need to emote about that. But at the end of the day, I am convinced that he has my best in mind and I will not be separated from his love. Now, the danger is starting our conversations here with people that might be far from God instead of underlining how difficult it is, how much you wrestle with God about it, 
how much you don't understand and how much you haven't figured out yet. And then over time, be able to rest in this assurance of Christ's love for us in the midst of our prayers. And we'll conclude with Isaiah 61, 1 through 3. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. So I put God renews, redeems, and restores, and he brings forth life. Sometimes it, it happens here and now, and sometimes it happens with the hope of new creation. See, I don't believe that we were only intended for this life only. I believe that part of the Christian hope is that we have hope for new creation. And this gives our lives purpose and significance now, and it gives hope for our future. It's unwise to put too much emphasis on my life right now, and it's unwise to put too much emphasis on the eternal. It's a tension to manage, so let's keep on praying. Any other thoughts, questions, comments? <laughs> so much great stuff, Kara says. So we, we'll, maybe we can do a little um, you know, Facebook Live during the week, but uh, just in light of time, we're going to close. And uh, All right, let's pray. Lord, um, thank you for this. Thank you for this time. Thank you for this topic. Thank you for us wrestling with it. Uh, thank you for what you call the body of Christ. Thank you for our community at large. Thank you for our nation. Um, Lord, thank you for, for us being global citizens. And let us stand in the gap of the in-between times in a way that would bring glory to your name. Help us to be filled with love and help us to, to be concerned for the other more than ourselves, to lay down our lives and to, to truly pursue a, a, a loving uh, relationship, a surrendered relationship with God the Father and the Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Lord, you are an awesome and mighty God. And let us continue to pursue you as you pursue us. And let us call upon your name as Jesus intercedes on our behalf. And may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, Lord. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all for joining us. Um, it's awesome to be able to do church in this way. Uh, stay tuned for next week. Obviously, we, we don't know. We're going to take it one week at a time. Um, but we do hope that you find this to be uh, helpful. And if you have any thoughts on how we can do this better, just let us know. We're always looking to improve. Um, so have a great week. God bless you.